So I'm going to share my screen so I can get the PowerPoint up if that's okay with you. So Nate, I was just going to mention to you, I got your email about that, the codes. Do you want to send that out to everybody? Because we've uploaded the other three into the meeting invite. Um, or we can just make it available after, or maybe put a link to it in the um, comments. Yeah. Are you recording? I think um, we'll get it put onto the Google Drive after, and then um, we can push it out after, and I can share a screen if need to, um, to get you set up. So there's a couple of requests for everyone to mute. Nobody wants to hear my shouting about eating uh, too much fun food here around the table. And then um, we will be sharing the PowerPoint afterwards and we have some other resources for you as well when we're done today. Harley, can you do a mute all? Oh gosh, you know, I have some talent, Peter. I'm not sure if I have that. The blender. Yeah, it sounds like somebody's <laughs> making a smoothie. I, I thought it was sewing. I thought it was a wild animal. Oh my gosh, this is so funny. I <laughs> guess it's a margarita. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, yeah, let's see. Hello, everyone. Hi there. Hi. Hi. So I'm not seeing how I can mute everybody, but if um, someone has a tip, that would be great. <gasps> Tawny Dotson, did you get an announcement today? You scared me. <laughs> <laughs> Your face popped up in my grid and I was like, Tawny Dotson. I did get an announcement today. You grinning cheek to cheek. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So those of you who don't know Tony Dotson, who is a complete rock star in our system, amongst other rock stars, was selected, one of two people selected out of our state system to join this fall or this July's cohort of Aspen Presidential Fellows. So Tony Dotson and Gita Bangara from Bellevue. So congratulations to both of you. Huge honor for our system. I think there's a, a third, I, I think, Chrissy, is it oh. Davis from uh, Spokane? Oh, I didn't see that. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I think will make so. a note of that. Thank you for telling yeah. me. Thank you. All I'm right. very excited. Eastern I'm Washington represented. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, congratulations, though. That's awesome. Hey, Carly, this is Alyssa. You were asking about the mute, unmute all feature. Yes. Hi, Alyssa. Hi. It's at the bottom of the participants panel, usually, for hosts. You should have um, three choices. There's like, like, I don't remember what they are right now because I'm not seeing it because like I'm not the control? host. Um, it's usually just at the bottom of the um, participants panel if you have that open. If you're in full screen sharing your slides, you might not be able to see it. You need yeah. to go back into the Zoom window. But okay. if you'd like to make me a co-host, I'd be happy to help manage it while you're talking. I was going to volunteer to do the same, yeah. Okay. But either way, you have to go back into the participants panel in order to either make myself or Nate a co-host. So I have to stop sharing? Um, you don't have to stop sharing. You just need to find your participants panel. Make you, it says make, a co, make you a host? A co-host. It's not giving me that option. It's making you the host. Okay. Well, you don't need okay. to do that then. <laughs> but I'm happy to help. Um, if you can if help I... me, Alyssa or Nate, make sure we monitor the chat just so we're making sure everyone's being heard. That would be great. 
Yeah, we can definitely help with the chat. Um, I just, we won't be able to have any access to anybody's microphones, so you'll have to handle that part. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are recording, so we will try, um, I will try my very best to make sure I can share that with all of you who have partners who are in meetings or otherwise occupied. And that was Lopez from Yakima. You need to mute yourself. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thanks for representing Yakima. This is kind of micro trends and how this so works. We're going to go ahead and have everyone mute themselves if they could. So I would be curious to um, do some research and see what's next <clears throat> for ag and, hmm. and for um, the IT. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. If anyone um, knows that yeah. voice, if you could touch that. Hey, that Wilma. I think it's Wilma Doolin from Yakima. Are we calling out the Yakima friends? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. We are recording. Um, we have a few slides to share with you and then we have some resources that were also embedded in this meeting invite. The meeting invite documents. Oh my gosh, of course I get something that says I'm going to desktop reboot right now. Hold on just a second. Sorry. I'm going to postpone that. Um, so what I, when we're done here today, we'll be able to share um, our uh, recorded meeting. We'll also share our PowerPoint. And there are three documents that are uploaded in the meeting invite that will also be uploaded today to the Google Drive that we have for COVID-19 resources on the State Board's homepage. So please, um, if you can't find any of those, you're welcome to ping myself or Nate and we're happy to um, provide those for you. So we have a lot of friends on the call. It's not just our friends in IC and WEC, it's also some friends in, uh, uh, I believe, back and from WISC and from Corrections, so welcome. We also have um, some um, celebrities with us. We have John Altman from the governor's office who has helped tremendously with this lift to partner with the community and technical colleges um, to get us to this point. So thank you, John, for joining us. And then some leadership from LNI, uh, specifically our friend Jody Robbins. So thank you very much for joining us today um, to uh, walk through the re-entry of these programs um, starting tomorrow. So I'm going to go ahead and go through a first couple of slides to give you some background. And then Nate is um, going to also go a little bit deeper into the essential programs list and the history behind it. So as you know, back in March, which seems so long ago, um, we had, uh, there was an issue, a proclamation issued by the governor's office about essential uh, sectors of work that could continue uh, during uh, this period of stay at home. And so those sectors um, were outlined, uh, those areas of, um, of work were specifically outlined in that document. And so, um, that kind of frames the conversation today, so I want to make sure to point that out to you in case you wanted to reference that. Um, it is on the governor's website. As you know, when this came out, the exception was nursing. Nursing was allowed to continue, and so the Nursing Commission worked with the state board, the governor's office, and with Independent Colleges of Washington and the Council of Presidents, which represents the four-year public universities, to help provide some parameters for nursing and some flexibility in nursing to make sure that we could have our students uh, stay in um, labs and use simulation virtual or in person uh, to complete their areas of study. So that was underway and we had an extension then uh, at that time to May 4th for the Safer at Home initiative. And so at that point, we all um, worked to figure out, at this, as you know, on our campuses, how we were going to address medical assist, or excuse me, how we were going to address the other professional and technical programs that weren't able to have a lab or hands-on component offered during spring quarter. So as you know, we went from um, the beginning of April uh, or actually from the end of March through uh, a couple of weeks ago to try to um, request and advocate for additional healthcare programs to be included in the exception that nursing was. And so we advocated for medical assisting, 
respiratory therapy and phlebotomy. Those requests were, um, uh, were considered and medical assisting and respiratory therapy were given um, the green light to proceed uh, starting with May, uh, before May 4th. Or, and so that, um, at that point, that was about two weeks ago, we were waiting then for the understanding from the Department of Health and their guidance to continue those two programs before May 4th came, uh, came to pass. As you know, the timeline uh, was shrinking. We weren't getting that feedback from the Department of Health. We were waiting on their guidance. And so as that was, as we were waiting there, at the same time, we received a request from the governor's office to uh, provide an essential programs list. So what programs should continue um, as we reopen the state and try to kind of do a phase one, if you will, approach to reentering um, from a safer at home initiative. And so there was an alignment of the essential sectors uh, and the programs that would align with our programs on our campuses with those essential sectors. There was an initial uh, crosswalk done and a list was created. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Nate in just a minute to talk about the methodology behind that. But before that, um, once that was done and that was complete and that was done, keep in mind the timing of it, this is over a weekend, this is last weekend. And um, by Tuesday of this past week, that programs list was um, provided to the governor's office. And so the governor's office was able to take that um, list and work with the Department of um, Health and to work with LNI and to work with other partners to make sure that if we were to get the permission to, to have these essential programs um, allowable or permitted back on campuses with social distancing, there had to be the understanding and the support of um, safety requirements. And so we had to make sure that the safety requirements, the social distancing, the PPE, and all of that were in place before we could go forward. So one of the attachments that you have to this meeting invite is that safety protocol. And so you'll see how, um, how very in, um, involved it is and very strident it is. And so just know that that was approved by, um, by um, L&I and the Department of Health. And so we have that, and that is key to allowing us back into um, the labs tomorrow. So um, maybe Nate, at this point, I'll have you take over and talking about the essential programs listing and the methodology, and then we could uh, revisit the discussion on safety protocols. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Carly. Uh, so, if you really want to know what my weekend was like the weekend before this one, <laughs> it was living in the <laughs> wonderful world of uh, zip codes. And so, um, my colleagues at the state board will remember that every time they asked me to do a work session in the Legislature, my first legislation, I started off by talking about the wonderful world of zip sock crosswalks and how much I just love them. Not really. Um, but so what we did was we basically took the governor's essential um, critical infrastructure sectors, um, the 14 page document uh, that I put in the chat for you, uh, the first link that I put in there, um, which is an appendix to the uh, stay home order, which is executive order 2025, which is the second link in the chat box. Uh, and we crosswalked that. So we went through that with a fine tooth comb looking for each of the occupations that's called out and extracted those out first. Uh, and that basically gave us the 13 sectors. We uh, then also took into consideration the fact that the governor had recently uh, reopened much of the construction industry and so added that one. So you don't actually see it here because it got chopped off on the slide, but there is a final bullet below hazardous materials for construction trades. And so I want to just uh, point that out. So we took essential work or essential sectors. That was my fault. That wasn't Nate. That was my fault. <laughs> Sorry about construction. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and so in the attachment to today's meeting, that looks like uh, a PDF version of an Excel document over an Excel table. That far left column where it says essential sectors, those are all aligned directly to uh, the terminology used in the governor's executive order. 
we took that and crosswalked that through a tip sock over to essential workers and then took programs using again tip sock to get to um, how we classify our programs to get to an essential programs um, listing. What you're seeing on that essential programs list are actually, uh, for the most part, the four digit zip codes that we utilize in our world uh, for understanding and mapping our program. So the titles that you're seeing there are coming directly off of the federal uh, 2010 zip code list. We use 2010 instead of 2020 because we still are living in that world right now. Uh, from there, we were able to drill down to the actual occupations and get to a six digit zip code listing. Uh, but as you might imagine, Harlan. it's 42 four digit codes are um, <laughs> eligible for crosswalk. It's quite the extensive Harlan. list and specific getting down to that six digit level. Uh, so from there, we were able to present that information uh, to the governor's office. We did that in concert with our partners at Relax. the independent colleges uh, as well as the council of presidents and then um, our partners over at the workforce training board as well since they also uh, regulate uh, programs in our, in this space of workforce ed and finally we worked uh peter guzman i'm not sure if he's on the call with us and jody robbins worked Harlan, through stop. confirming that none of our apprenticeship programs were missing from um, from the list as well that would be appropriate based on the essential sector and essential workers. Uh, so from there that went over to the governor's office uh, and was kicked back for us. Uh, so many, many um, kudos to uh, Heather Stock on the team as well as Carolyn McKinnon for helping uh, with the initial pass at that and the brain power of pulling that uh, crosswalk together uh, and then getting this to a, a usable list. Um, so what we've also generated since the actions on Friday night is that uh, is a PDF version that's the expanded listing of this crosswalk from the quote unquote four digit codes to the six digit codes and we'll make that available after today's call. So that's the, the basic methodology that went into uh, the listing that you saw that came out on Friday night. Uh, and from there, whenever you're ready, Carly, we can shift over into the uh, safety protocol information. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And so I do think that Friday night when we got the green light, I don't know, Nate, about 9 <laughs> p.m. Um, <laughs> Sounds about right. I know. My, we, I think everybody called each other about 9.15 or 9.30. And so um, there was a second wave of energy from state board employees on Friday night about um, how excited we were to receive John Altman's um, email regarding the green light for us to resume with safety protocols and essential programs in tow um, our, our work on uh, Tuesday. So we're really excited. Um, the distribution list um, I think was sent out in the afternoon as uh, Nate mentioned. And then, um, as you saw, there are three uh, attachments, one of, to your email, excuse me, to your email invite, and one of them was also the safety protocol. So do you want to speak to the safety protocol, basically how it was developed? It might help with a little bit of background. Sure. Um, so uh, I made the mistake of accepting a, a phone call invite. So you shouldn't accept any more Zoom invites that involve, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, uh, and was designated to work with our counterparts in the industrial hygiene uh, department at LNI or DOSH, which is the uh, Department of Occupational Safety and Health at LNI. And we, uh, the three of us, two of their uh, industrial hygienists and I uh, worked through a process that would come to a, an actually viable path forward for programs. And so we, we had kicked over kind of our, our non-industrial hygienist nine bullet points over to LNI for them to start with. Um, and we were very fortunate that actually a member of the team there in the industrial hygiene department uh, actually uh, had a, a history of working in labs in higher education. So she was actually really wonderful to work with. Um, from there, uh, we went back and forth and um, long story short is, is that I put the boxing gloves on and I got the 30 bullet point construction industry uh, requirements down to 29. Um, 
<laughs> I, I think that was a little bit of a win personally, but you know. Um, so basically what we had to do was figure out exactly what would be most appropriate and then trying to make sure that the, the gist of everything would maintain not just the, the health and safety, but also there's a really important part here around the fact that, and I apologize for those of you that have heard me use this analogy a thousand times now, there really is kind of a, a, a four part to this that has to be in alignment. Students have to feel very comfortable with um, the measures that we've taken. Faculty have to feel comfortable with the measures. Um, our staff on campuses, as well as any um, employer partners that we're working with or JATCs or apprenticeship partners that we're working with for our work-based learning component. And so that uh, you've heard the four-legged stool analogy a thousand times, but it really is that way that we all of those folks have to feel comfortable. And so the 29 bullets that are outlined in the um, COVID-19 restart requirements document spell out exactly how we would get there. And I'm confident that if we uh, took those seriously and implemented those and wrote our plans to those, that that would deliver on that promise of making sure that folks recognize the measures that we're taking um, are appropriate and, and creating that safe learning and working environment. Um, at the end of the day, these are tied to state statutes. And so um, we are obligated as employers to provide a safe work environment. Uh, you'll see the citation right there on the very first page of the document um, that each employer shall furnish to each of their employees, a place of employment free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause serious injury or death to his or her employees. Uh, and so at the end of the day, there is an enforcement mechanism from the Department of Labor and Industries, from their DOSH department, to enforce that we would have to provide that. And so I just wanna make sure that uh, your attention's there and that you're giving that the, the due seriousness of um, your responsibility as an employer in this state. Um, we can also take the moment to go through kind of the bucket of uh, the document. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and read it you. to you. Uh, yeah. Real quick, I'm going to go through and mute everyone. And if you're muted, Nate, by my inner version to know how to do the technology, I apologize. But I'm going to mute everyone. And so if you'll unmute yourself if I, if I do that inadvertently. So, okay, now it looks like you're muted. So if you can unmute and then continue. Sorry, we're just getting a lot of feedback. No worries. Thank you. I'll fix now. So there's a series of requirements or buckets within the document. First is the requirement that there has to be a COVID-19 uh, safety supervisor um, at each location or their designee, right? And so the, the thought here is that uh, there needs to be someone that is that point of contact on each one of the campuses uh, for providing that. And I would argue that you would want to, based on the program structures that you would have on campus, um, need to have that designee indicated um, for your program areas that are going to be specific and nuanced to each one of these programs. Um, and then that individual, uh, and then your faculty member or your instructor, if they're able to fulfill that function, would then be required under the training place, uh, the training bucket, to provide an initial training at the beginning of the restart of class to make sure that folks are comfortable, that they know how to use the equipment that's been provided to them, um, and that they know where all of the um, uh, equipment is that they would need to ensure that they are uh, safe uh, and where that sanitation, those hand washing stations, those kinds of things are located. And then there's quite a bit of detail about how we should maintain the social distancing within the learning environment. Uh, that's not an optional thing. It's very much a you must be able to do this. And if you're not, then that's not a program that could operate in a phase one environment. Okay. I think that's really important for us to, to make sure that we're recognizing within this document. Uh, Nate, a bullet quick, point that's worth... No, yeah. I'm just going to say you got a question related to that. Is that a COVID administrator for each campus or each teaching site off campus? So that would... Um, my understanding is that it would need to be at each physical location. So if you have a, a main campus and a satellite site, you would have to have a supervisor or a supervisor designee for each one of those um, peripheral locations or those satellites as well. Okay, there has to be a point of contact for each one of those, um, those physical locations. Thank you. Great question. Yep. Um, of, import, of, of important note uh, within the document is item number 10. This is one that required a lot of negotiation. 
Uh, we recognize that there are certainly going to be um, questions around situations and specifically around uh, what triggered bullet number 10 was a conversation around EMT, uh, truck driver, those types of programs that have ride along components. And so um, basically there's a recognition that in those situations, there's going to have to be additional measures taken because of the fact that in those specific cases with really low ratios, you may have folks that come in closer contact than the six feet um, for, for a period of time, right? And so you would need to write a very specific plan for those programs. And this bullet is what's providing for that opportunity. That so long as you can figure out a way to meet all the requirements as outlined by either DOH, the CDC, or LNI, then at that point, that very specific plan will be able to be used in those scenarios. Um, keep in mind, there's a very specific document for uh, our commercial driver's license CDL programs. Uh, the next uh, overarching bucket is around um, personal protective equipment and the fact that that needs to be employer or training program provided. And so uh, based on the, the program, you will be required to be providing things like gloves, goggles, eye protection, um, face shields and those kinds of things as appropriate, um, depending upon how the, the program is going to operate. One of the important things to point out here is um, that there is emerging information at the CDC that the virus theoretically could be transmittable uh, via the eye, right? And so that's part of the reason for the eye protection is to make sure that um, any droplets that were created by someone that did not recognize or did not have symptoms, uh, was asymptomatic, wouldn't be able to transmit that um, to one of your students. And again, it speaks to the fact that if the PPE is not available, so if those pieces of equipment don't exist for whatever reason, then that program is not eligible to run in a phase one environment. Okay. Uh, the next bucket is around sanitation and cleanliness. And this gets into the fact that soap and running water needs to be available uh, and that um, alcohol-based sanitizers at very specific levels are also required if they uh, do not have access to soap and running water. Uh, there is not a forgiveness for not having running water. So um, I know that it's common thought that if you've got the alcohol-based sanitizer that you don't need the running water. In this case, we are required uh, in a work environment to have um, running water as a part of that as well. Uh, the standards around uh, the hand sanitizer and those kinds of things need to be clearly posted, kind of what are the expectations of an individual in this space. So having a posted placard with that information uh, is required. So Nate, there was a quick question in the chat. I thought the final draft to remove safety goggles as a requirement. So it does not have uh, safety goggles as a requirement, but it is a requirement if that's something that's appropriate for the operation of that program. So it doesn't have a very specific bullet to that point saying that no matter what you have to have it, but if it makes appropriate sense for that program, then yes, you would need it in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so there is another question related. Um, and we mm -hmm. can we can pause on these and we can do this a little bit later, but just real quick, this yeah. is to what you just mentioned. Can the running water be down the hall or does it have to be in the classroom or lab? Um, right, so uh, my understanding is, is that so long as the, there was the restroom, you know, that's how we're structured, then that would be okay. That they can come and go to that space um, and, and use the normal and existing um, sink and soap that's available that way. Um, if it's an extended uh, distance to that thing, or if it's in another building, that's a situation where you're going to need to have the, the hand sanitizer option uh, to go forward with the water as well. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm just checking to see if there are any other questions that I had missed there. Okay. There's a few more that we could talk about that weren't necessarily related that were program specific, so we can come back to those. Sure. Um, just to wrap us up then on the kind of buckets here, um, so there's the, the protocols around employee and student health and the, there are any individuals who may exhibit symptoms. Um, so basically here is that where you need to have a policy that encourages anyone who um, thinks they may be ill or is ill to refrain from coming to the to campus um, 
and also basically having a, a process in place to inform an individual um, that they need to leave if they have that. There is a temperature requirement uh, or taking of a temperature. Um, there is two options within that bucket. So item number 22 speaks specifically to the nuances of taking a temperature either on site or requiring the individual within your plan to uh, take their own temperature and be willing to attest to that uh, upon arrival. Uh, basically anyone who fails to comply. So if you decided to take temperatures whenever an individual arrives to campus and they refuse to allow that to occur, they're not allowed to participate at that point. Okay, if that's the way that your policy is structured. Um, and finally, there's a reminder here that any employee specifically under the federal legislation that passed um, who feels unsafe in their work environment, they have a right to assert that and they have, mm -hmm. must be honored and given the full rights that are afforded to them under the um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which basically enables them to state, I don't feel safe or comfortable in this environment. And so therefore I want to not be involved in that. Um, so that is a provision that's spelled out for you. Uh, that's in item 24. And finally, um, there is a requirement that if anyone identifies themselves as being COVID positive, uh, then you must have a methodology in place for how you're going to communicate to those individuals who may have been exposed. Um, the last requirement, uh, item number 26, is um, where you're required to maintain your um, your daily class attendance logs or those that have come and visited the campus or visited a program, uh, including their name, phone number, email address of all of those individuals and maintain that for a minimum of four weeks. Uh, and the reason for that is so that appropriate contact, tra contact tracing can be performed uh, should an individual um, become positive at some point uh, so that we can notify those that may have been exposed to seek testing at that point. So I saw a flurry of questions that dropped. So I'm going to try and see if I can catch up with those. I'm not sure, do Carly, you if you've got to, a couple off hand. Well, why don't we move to questions? Um, do you want to okay. start off on these three? Well, we kind of address the second one, and then I'll go back up and scroll down and ask you questions. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. <laughs> okay. I'm going to the grab my water, one. though. Oh, yeah. Please rehydrate. Um, so we were getting some emails over the weekend. What if my program's not on the list or X program is on the list or should it, is it allowable? So how, um, how do, you, do colleges go about verifying that, Nate? Yep, so um, as a follow-up to today, we have a, um, a follow-up fourth document because you can never have too many handouts from the state board, right? So the fourth document is that crosswalk from the broader categories or program types over to um, those quote unquote six digit SIPs, right? And so we're gonna provide that to help provide some clarity and help answer some questions that are there for those programs that are pre-vetted for you to, to help reduce some of that. And then the other thing that I would say is that you should be operating on the side of caution, right? So if there's any question or any doubt, reach out to us at the board and we'd be happy to help make that determination. And if we need to seek additional guidance about a particular program, we can get to the right resources to ask that question to make sure as to whether or not that should be operated. Um, but again, utilizing your resources, reach out to us. Um, in fact, on the bottom of that crosswalk document, uh, it even says for any questions to please contact us in the workforce ed department, we'd be more than happy to, to, um, to work with you and figure that out if there's a, a nuanced question there. Uh, there is a question I see on the slide here too around uh, dental hygiene programs and whether or not those were included. Uh, they are not included in the phase one aspect and there's several reasons for that. First off is the um, current executive order that extends through May 18th uh, that restricts um, certain non-emergency uh, medical procedures and that having included dental care, uh, routine dental care, uh, still is basically keeping most of our dental clinics closed uh, as far as I know. The other side of that is that there's virtually no way for us to meet the requirements of the phase one six foot social distance for hands on practice in those dental programs, right? Mm -hmm. And so that um, the industrial hygiene, you know, one of the examples that was given um, was well, we can do it and we can have one person um, interacting with a patient and we'll project it on the screen and everyone can watch that. Well, there's still 
I haven't figured out how to be six feet from someone's mouth while still being able to perform a procedure, right? So at this point in phase one, those programs are not yet in the clear. Um, but that is something that continues to be a, a, a question. And as that continues to go through, as, as we have success in phase one, that is certainly something I think may be under consideration in phase two, working with our partners at L&I. Awesome. So Nate, I'm just scrolling back up to some questions that are in the chat. The first one is, um, uh, there was someone that told the president's group that essential sector instruction was only for students planning to graduate in the spring. Please clarify. That's a great question. Um, so what we've been speaking about with that is that that is um, a prioritization, right? And so as you are implementing these um, social distancing measures, certainly that should be the, the first group that you're working on, but there's not a restriction within these guidance documents that would restrict you from being able to serve um, a student not at that point in their term, right? Um, but with that in mind, you are very likely that if you're following all of the requirements in um, in the document, the protocols document, that you're going to have a restricted size of cohort that you're going to be able to get into those spaces on campus. And so um, we would say that the guidance from the state board will be to first serve those students closest to graduation that you can get across the threshold and out into practice. So the, another question, uh, there's a couple that are uh, somewhat program specific, but I think um, we can try to answer those. And if not, we can refer to the the list of your crosswalk provided. Uh, the first is how expansive is the definition of transportation? Flagger training is a common class that we currently cannot run. Yeah, um, so I can attest to that one specifically, uh, and you will see that one in the crosswalk. That is a part of the, uh, the ground transportation world. So um, flagging and traffic control as a piece of that it serves both on the construction side and on the transportation side, but it's called out specifically within transportation and logistics as a sector, as a, as a training program that will be eligible. Yep. Okay, great. What about flight programs um, uh, following CDL guidance? Yep, so that was, um, that one was a toughie. It's, it is cleared um, and it is on the air transportation side. Uh, it's a matter of trying to figure out what are the protocols that you would be able to meet the requirements. So obviously you're not gonna be able to hit the, the six foot of distancing. So I would say a, looking at how much of the, the protocols you can get to and, and identify those and then what are the mitigators that you would have in place to ensure, um, to ensure safety, right? So you can't exactly open up the windows in the cockpit the way that they're called for in the CDL training, but you could look for what would be some kind of um, way of providing the appropriate level of PPE to get you to that point. The main thing is that you're gonna write this down as a plan. And if you have questions about that plan at some point, or you have uncertainties, we can certainly work with you and act as a broker um, with the folks at l to make sure that you're able to get to a comfortable place. So Nate, another question is, and this is a little bit outside the program questions, um, is there clarification of the timing in which we'll be able to resume hands-on clinical rotations for programs? Um, at this point, I don't um, have something beyond that point. To so certain programs, so for example, your um, the Nursing Commission and the Department of Health have issued the ability for those programs to proceed um, using first simulation and then also the ability to go into clinical spaces. So your nursing um, RN uh, LPN and your nurse aides are all in that uh, bucket for going forward with that. Your other programs at this point, um, we're still seeking clarification on that. We don't yet have a timeline to give you on that. So there is another question a little bit more specific to programs. Given that some skills in labs like blood draws for phlebotomy require direct contact between individuals, how do we proceed? Uh, I would say just like in the last question, that's something that we're trying to get those clarifications on as to how those programs would go. Um, and we're working with the Department of Health since they regulate those particular programs um, on how that will go forward. Uh, we did have the, the work that we've already undertaken for uh, phlebotomy, uh, respiratory therapy, and uh, medical assisting, which would include phlebotomy, um, that we're uh, getting those clarifications on right now. And as soon as we have them, we'll get this out to you. 
Do we have to verify identity at the screen or attendance points on campus? That is a fantastic question that I will have to write down and clarify. I would imagine that um, I would certainly hope that you have um, established a knowledge of who your students are whenever they are in your class, uh, if they're coming to campus. Um, so I think in the same way that you would establish that identity for instructional purposes, you would want to make sure you're still doing that for uh, contract chasing purposes as well. We can certainly figure out, um, we'll ask that question and get back to you. There was a question, Nate, about clarification regarding machining, welding, manufacturing labs requiring eye protection. CDL does not. Will students in truck driving training need to wear eye protection? I think that's a great question. Um, it's not specified and actually um, it is specified in the truck driver document. So it says in the truck driver document that instructors and testers um, should receive gloves, masks, goggles or face shields and um, uh, the appropriate cleaning products, right? So in that case, in the CDL document, it is specified that they would need to have eyewear protection as a part of being in that environment. And just to clarify on that, that's the guidance that was issued last week for offering uh, CDL programs to restart, correct? I'm sorry, can you ask that one last time? So what you're referencing in regards to the CDL guidance, that is what you're referencing from last week's guidance that was issued to the, allow that program to re-enter the, work uh, the workspace for training. Right, so this is the, um, from that same, it's the same attachment that's on this, um, this meeting invite. Uh, there's a separate document entitled uh, Commercial Driver's Licensing in Cab Training. And that one is uh, on the very first page under PPE, it specifies um, those four bullets there. So uh, let's see, do colleges purchase their own PPE or can they request additional PPE from Washington Department of Emergency Management? So we're working on that uh, at this point. Um, it's, it's a bit of a stay tuned. So obviously if you have your own mechanisms for being able to secure that, I would certainly be encouraging you to, to, to be seeking that information. We are following up right now, uh, working in tandem with the governor's office and DES around how our colleges and programs can get onto um, that priority list for access and figuring out where our institutions and programs would fall on that list. Uh, so stay tuned for that and we'll let you know as soon as we have more detail. I'm not sure if you have anything else for that, Carly. No. Um, the other, another question, uh, we heard this earlier today too. Um, what do we do about the required first aid CPR class requirements for our class required to do clinicals? I think that's health 105 some, in some instances. Yeah. There has been some guidance that's come out from the nursing commission relative to that specifically. Um, and I will double check on that. Uh, but I'm almost, uh, we'll double check. I don't want to say the wrong thing on the line here, but we'll double check on this first aid okay. <laughs> We are recording, so we'd have to that in infamy. Um, Great. Let's see, yeah, <laughs> right. So to clarify, no students other than nursing and medical assistant programs are allowed to attend clinical rotations. Right, so based on the, the guidance that we have from DOH, so there's a, basically there's kind of two ways of thinking about this. So the nursing commission has been the one that has opened up the nursing programs to be able to operate as being deemed essential. And that was um, outside of kind of executive action going through and providing the option for this broader listing to be approved, right? So the, the way that you would follow kind of hierarchy here is that if those programs can operate underneath that DOH or nursing commission guidance, that's the place where you're wanting to operate that program. If it's not eligible for that, these full guidelines are gonna have to apply to those programs that are not specifically called out um, as having a, a, a separate kind of exemption, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in order to operate. Does this apply to off-site contract training programs held at companies or non-college locations? I'm assuming the safety Sorry, protocols. 
So the question is, does this apply to offsite contract training programs held at companies or non-college locations? And I'm assuming the requirements of PPE and safety. And the answer is yes. If it's an issued program by us, we yeah. have to have that adherence. Right. If the reason if the operation of that program is involving you as a as a training partner or as a as an operating partner, absolutely. This is the only way that you're able to be involved in that is for these protocols to be in place to protect your employees and to protect your students. Um, I'm not sure on this one too much, but it says what do we do about the castle branch requirements for immunization? For that one, I'm gonna have to Call on a resource, and we will. Yeah, I, we need a phone one. a friend on that one. I don't know that one either. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a another question regarding what about the COVID administrator on site for contract training? Is that a requirement as well? So if we for a contract, do we have to have a COVID administrator on site? Your plan would need to make sure that there is a supervisor available to make sure that. Um, programs are operating in compliance with your plan. So yes, regardless of whether or not they're un operating underneath their contract, if they are operating under the auspices of your institution, then yes, all the requirements are required. So question about, um, there's a question about documents that will receive. The crosswalk is also being uploaded, so you will receive that as well. So. The documents we referenced, if you don't see them in your invites, some people got them, some people didn't, um, we will make sure that they're all available on our website uh, for the state board. When you open up the state board's website, there's a um, kind of a runner along the top, a ribbon that has the COVID-19 references, and in those folders is where you'll find the information. If you have any trouble with that though, Nate and I um, don't receive enough emails. So if you would like to send us some emails requesting that, we'd be happy to send that to you too um, as well. Um, no, one last question it looks like, Nate. Um, was there any differentiation between dental hygiene and dental assisting? Is it all dental related programs postponed until after phase one? At this point, yes, that could certainly change over time, but at this point, um, those were not included uh, in the in the phase one operation. So that would apply to both dental hygiene, dental assisting, uh, and there's one other that's slipping my mind right this moment. Oh, I see one other question pop in. Virtually every, well, hold on, they're moving fast. Virtually every prof tech instructor will at times intrude within the six foot safety bubble of a student. Is there an exemption for faculty to get closer than six feet to a student? So the, the intention here is that you're going to be able to maintain that, right? So that would mean instructing that student to step away so that the faculty member can step into that space, right? Um, one of the things that's called out in the document is the utilization of things like floor tape, like what we're seeing in um, grocery stores and those kinds of things to create those boxes, to create those bubbles. Uh, and so the expectation is that uh, at times they're going to need to be uh, asked to do that in order to operate. Keep in mind, this is phase one. This is not, uh, the governor uh, spelled out a four phase approach to how this is going to roll back. So it's not intended to be a, a wide open, all of these things and all the activities are going to be able to do that. There's, there's an understanding that this is not, um, widely permissive and we we appreciate the trouble that that's going to create and the, the heartache that's going to create um but it is a it is a requirement for us to honor our responsibility to to our students and to our, our 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 employees so question does the required safety training for faculty and staff need to be in person or can it be done virtually uh the the training piece to to begin that's a great question. And in fact, we um, we received a question from our college uh, over the weekend about the state board trying to uh, maybe create a video that could be used by all programs. We're investigating that. Um, we're not sure of our ability with our vendors to be able to turn that around uh, in a timely fashion, but we're still investigating that and hope to have some clarity there. But certainly if there was something like a video or a, uh, something that could be done, um, once the individuals are there my understanding is that it needs to be done in the space so that um, individuals can be familiar with where the locations of various aspects of safety and disinfecting and those kinds of things are actually located um, but certainly if that was something that needed to be done in that way it can be 
also remember there's a requirement um, in that document that this is done on the first uh, upon return, but then it also receives an, a weekly uh, update thereafter. And so it would have to be redone in case anything's changed or shifted in that time frame. So a couple last questions and then we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, cosmetology question mark, not included in phase one. Um, Dan Ferguson, uh, Director of Center of Excellence in Allied Health, is offering, um, uh, it looks like you're offering an invitation to folks if they do not have representatives attending Allied Health and Nursing Weekly phone calls. So um, Dan Ferguson, uh, based out of Yakima Valley, um, is providing an open invitation. Thank you, Dan. Requirements or expectations for additional cleaning and disinfecting shared areas and restrooms. Um, I assume most colleges that says don't have the resources to provide enough additional custodians to meet this need. Is there a shared responsibility? And I know the presidents have been talking a... about that. So I think we probably should kick that back to the president's group. So I'm happy to take that back um, to the Wednesday call with the presidents if there is a, a request to do so. Um, two last questions, Nate. Oh, and Kathy Alston is offering some resources about PPE. Kathy, thank you for that. Um, is there guidance for how to collect at, at a station information as students arrive on campus? Something they sign in person or do they do that online? And I think that's up to uh, the individual so college to track. It is up to the individual college. There is a requirement, um, and I'm going to see if I can find it really quickly. It's down in the, oof. so item 26 is what requires the, the attendance log to be um, created and maintained, but it is referenced in a prior bullet, um, and that is up in item number 22, which is around the time that a student will be arriving or an employee will be arriving on campus. And so at the end of that, it talks about the fact that um, that information needs to be collected um, by an individual. So it's not that that student is um, writing that down. So no shared document, no shared pens, right? It should be that that faculty member is recording that information for who's there, right? So it's not that you're collecting a signature, you're just collecting the names, numbers, and email addresses of those individuals each day. Certainly a, a faculty member, if they've got their, their sheet for the day and they've already got it preloaded with that information, they could just check off who's there each one of those days. Um, but we need to maintain that documentation for at least the four weeks. Um, and the same will be true as whoever was that um, person checking individuals' uh, employees in to the, to the campus as well, right? Those same things, same protocols have to be there because an employee would need to be accounted for in the same way for each day. Nate, and one last question to wrap. It's, there's a question that says, it sounds like programs in which labs involve students working directly on each, on each other, sorry, will not be permitted in phase one since they would be closer than six feet. For example, ultrasound. Is this a correct interpretation? I think that's fair, right? Um, at least under the current operations, the, the, the places where we are looking for or where we have current exemptions for that or in the nursing programs, the three levels of nursing. Um, the uh, outside of that at this point, it would need to fall of these protocols. Okay. So last slide has my email, Nate's email. Um, I think most of you have my cell phone, so feel free at any point to reach out. Um, we're happy to answer any questions or any nuances. I'm going to see how, uh, maybe I'll have to ask Alyssa to help me. Uh, we'll take the recording from this and we'll be able to share it as well. And then and again, if you don't have one of those resources we uploaded, please let us know. Um, check the website. If you don't find it on the website, please just give us um, a call or send us a quick message and we'll be happy to respond. So Nate, thanks for being my partner in crime. I appreciate it. Um, thank you to the governor's office and to LNI for helping us get um, these programs back into um, back onto our campuses tomorrow. So we all recognize how crazy this past these past two months have been. So thank you for um, working with us. Thank you for sharing 
your um, concerns and your questions with us and we can only help serve you better if we hear from you. So we really appreciate you taking the time this past hour to work with us and to um, have us go through this with you. So thank you again. And um, again, if there is a need, we'll be happy to do another one of these. So please let us know. Okay, Nate, any parting words of wisdom or we're, we're all talked out? Uh, just <laughs> thank you all for your, for your time today. If you have questions, let us know. We'll make sure to email out just after the call um, that crosswalk list for you as well. All right. Great. All right, everyone, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks. Hey, Carly, you got 30 seconds to chat? I do. I can't figure out how to stop recording. Just to hold on. <laughs>